Good evening. Welcome to uh, From Zero Day to Doomsday. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Piebeck, uh, and I'm the module team's chair uh, of a new OU module, uh, Introduction to Computing and Information Technology 2, uh, also known as TM112. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to introduce uh, today's talk by my TM112 colleague, Mike Richards. Uh, Mike is a senior lecturer in the Open University's Faculty of Science, Technology, uh, Engineering and Mathematics, known as STEM. Uh, in From Zero Day to Doomsday, he will talk about the WannaCry ransomware cyber attack, which had serious implications last year for the NHS and businesses around the world. Mike will focus on the potential threat from hidden software bugs that are being exploited by criminals and governments alike, with the intention of causing harm to the computer systems upon which we all uh, rely. Uh, after his lecture, Mike will be joined by a panel of uh, experts to discuss the topic in more depth, um, when you will also have the opportunity to have your say and to share any experiences you may have had with cybercrime yourself. I'll hand over um, in a few minutes to Professor uh, Joseph Fraser, who will tell us a bit more about Mike's uh, academic uh, career. Uh, Professor Fraser is uh, Executive Dean for the Faculty of Science, Engineering, Technology and Mathematics here at the Open University. And before I do that, let me run through the format of uh, tonight's uh, event. Uh, once Professor Fraser has done her introduction, Mike will deliver his lecture, which will be followed by a panel discussion, and then there will be time for questions from the audience and also uh, from the audience uh, via social media. Uh, we also invite you to engage on social media about this talk, talk uh, via the, the hashtag OUTalks. Um, so we are keen to hear from those of you who are joining us, uh, especially via live stream. Um, you will need to sign in to the web page you have been directed to, and please keep your comments and questions brief so that we can address them uh, during the Q&A. Um, this evening's lecture will be followed by a panel discussion in which Mike will be joined by um, Ray Corrigan, staff tutor in computing and communications, Nick Clancy, the information uh, security specialist at the OU information security uh, team, uh, Dr. Amel uh, Benasser, an OU lecturer in computing, and uh, after that uh, we invite you for uh, refreshments uh, downstairs. Um, before we start, I would like to draw your attention to the health and safety details uh, on the slide. Um, and I would now uh, like to hand over to Professor Josie Fraser, who will introduce Mike. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here tonight to talk about my colleague, Mike Richards. He's a senior lecturer, as you've already heard, in our School of Computing and Communications at the Open University. And Mike's been here since 1996. He's been an absolute pioneer at the OU. He has helped us trial teaching over the internet in its very earliest days. And he's taught a huge range of courses, all the way from introducing colleagues to robotics, right through to a conversation piece with students and work on teaching the engineering aspects of Leonardo da Vinci. He was one of the creators of the OU's first course in ubiquitous computers at a time when we didn't even have smartphones, or at least not very smart ones. Since then, he spent a lot of time teaching computer security, everything from the Enigma machine to talking about e-shopping and bitcoins. And Mike's one of the authors on a new module that we're introducing, the Introduction to Computing and Information Technology 2, and it's material from that module, at least partly, on which Mike's lecture today is based. Mike's been involved in all sorts of things at the OU, including some of our BBC co-productions. I know from chatting to him earlier this week that he's still slightly sore about the fact he didn't get invited to the BAFTA party. Um, but he has also <laughs> been involved in some of our most successful um, free courses. And along with Professor Arusha Bandara, who's the head of the School of Computing and Communications here, Mike co-authored an introduction to cybersecurity. And that's now been used by GCHQ, the Ministry of Defence, and lots of other areas to just train colleagues on the basics around cybersecurity. 
This course has had, unbelievably, over 200,000 students in more than 150 countries. So I think it's safe to say that we're going to hear tonight from a real expert in cybersecurity, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to tell us. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mike Richards. Thank you. Um, it'd probably be a good idea to save the applause for the end. I have no idea how this is going to go. Um, the good news is I've decided not to make this a talk lecture, so there's no exam at the end, unless you're one of my students, in which case there may be a test at the end. So tonight I'd like to talk about the events that started on the 12th of May last year, which made the national and international news. Uh, what had happened was during the morning, the NHS right across Britain was reporting isolated problems with uh, Windows PCs connected to their network. And by 1 p.m., four hospital trusts in the UK were reporting serious incidents, which meant it was escalated to the Department of Health and Social Care. What was happening were computers were freezing, restarting, crashing, and occasionally showing a rather ominous warning message telling users their computer files were no longer accessible and that they would need to pay a ransom. During the afternoon, the situation got significantly worse across the NHS until by 4 p.m., 16 trusts were in emergency care only, at which point the NHS went to its highest level of alert and shut down all routine surgeries, checkups, and admissions. Oops, I'm gone. as I said... I don't know what's happening. Here we go. Let's do that. The message on the screen was moderately terrifying, telling you no one can get into your files. There's no way back. You have to pay. And the ransom was $300 in the currency we now call Bitcoin. Restarting your computer, got the same message. Take the computer offline, it's got the same message. Try file recovery, nothing happened. By this point... Tests had been cancelled, people were being turned away from A&E, ambulances were being redirected. And it wasn't just PCs sitting on people's desktops, it was PCs connected to diagnostic equipment such as MRI scanners, CAT scanners, blood test results, everything was locking up. What had happened to the NHS was it had been attacked by something we now call WannaCry. And WannaCry is an example of malicious software. That software with the sole intent of causing harm to a computer. Now, because none of us can spell malicious to, uh, consistently, we shorten that to malware. And there are many, many, many types of malware. And all this um, WannaCry is a good example of what we call ransomware, because it takes your files ransom. You have to pay if you want them back. And the particular method that WannaCry uses to spread around a computer network is what it means it's known as a worm. And all a worm is is a self-contained piece of computer code that makes copies of itself on new machines. So one worm can quickly become thousands, millions, overwhelming a network and usually doing something nasty. Now, a worm is just a computer program made of thousands, tens of thousands of lines of code. But what you can do is divide the functionality of the worm into two. And inside the worm, you'll find two important parts. There's what we call the infection mechanism. That's how does it get onto a computer network, spread across a computer network, and then get into your computer. And then inside the worm is what we also know called the payload. This is the nasty bit. This is the, gives you the message that you can no longer access your files. So when you saw that horrible red screen on your computer, you were actually looking at the results of the worm's payload. So let's look at the payload first because that's what most people were worried about. I have to use a technical term here, encryption. Uh, if you don't know what encryption is, it's a branch of mathematics that is concerned with obscuring data so only certain people can see it. You use encryption when you send a, a signal message or WhatsApp or use a FaceTime messenger. Use encryption when you do online banking. Basically, encryption holds the world together. If, you really, if you're here in Milton Keynes and you really want to meet the experts in, in encryption, go just down the road to Bletchley Park and you'll see what was going there on there in the 1940s, both in creating encryption and, more importantly, breaking encryption being used by the opponents. 
Without going into the mathematics, I did promise there wasn't going to be a test, the only thing you need to know further about encryption is to use it, you need a small piece of data known as the key. And you create a key whenever you use encryption. Without the key, you can't break into modern encryption. You could have started trying to break an encrypted message when the universe was born. You would still make no impact on it today. Modern encryption, as far as we know, is completely unbreakable. So that's the reason that warning message came up. You can't get your files back. There's no way of getting around the encryption. There's many different types of encryption, and WannaCry uses two of them. And I'm going to skip the horrible details. Just to tell you, the first one goes by the name AES, which unimaginably stands for the Advanced Encryption Standard. And Advanced Encryption Standard uses one key to encrypt and then use the same key to decrypt the data. And AES is everywhere around us. Your Wi-Fi connection uses uh, AES. Your computer, your, your laptop, your mobile phone, your tablet, the contents, the data on it, the personal data, that's all protected by AES. And the reason for that is AES is unbelievably fast. You can encrypt a million files in a minute easily on even a moderate computer. The second type of encryption you find in WannaCry is a completely different family of encryption, going by the name RSA, which is after its inventors or near inventors uh, in America during the mid-1970s. RSA uses two keys. One key encrypts and one key decrypts. You can't do both operations with a single key. So, here's a computer. It's got some files on it. And what's going to happen is we'll just encrypt it with WannaCry. And the first thing WannaCry does when it sneaks onto your computer is it creates an RSA encryption key. It doesn't use it yet. You don't even know your computer's been infected. It just, and then it sets that key aside. Then, for every single file it's about to, enc to encrypt on your computer, it creates a new AES key and encrypts that document. Remember I said AES is very fast. A colleague and myself, we actually set up a computer, we isolated it from the rest of the network, and we put WannaCry on the computer. Within 30 seconds, that computer was completely locked up. There was no way back. AES had just encrypted the whole disk in less about 30 seconds. Now, the downside of AES, as I mentioned earlier, is the same key encrypts and decrypts. So, if it stopped here, you could get your files back because all the AES keys are just sitting there alongside the encrypted files. You just decrypt using AES. So WannaCry then turns to its master key. The master key encrypts the AES keys. So, all the key, the encrypt, the, so those keys are now locked away. And to make sure you can't get them back, WannaCry deletes the AES keys and your original files. All that's left are the encrypted files, which you can't get to because they need, you need the AES keys, and they're locked by the RSA key, and you don't have the decryption key. Technically, what we say at this point is the computer is completely screwed. <laughs> if your computer has been compromised at this point, what you do is you start thinking, I need to buy $300 worth of bitcoins and pay the ransom. And in theory, this is what happens. You scrape together $300 in bitcoin, and you send it off to the bad people who created WannaCry. By the way, never do this. Your mother should have told you, never send a, a cryptocurrency over the internet to people you don't know. In response, they should send you the RSA decryption key. And then you can use the RSA key to decrypt the AES keys, and then the AES keys can decrypt the original documents. And the word, however, is what comes up. Because for the first time, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it many more times tonight, WannaCry was not very well programmed. It was lashed together from bits of existing program, and it was buggy. And amazingly, despite the fact that the encryption code in WannaCry used Microsoft's own 
commands for encrypting built into Windows and which are incredibly reliable, if you tried to encrypt a large file, it became corrupted during the encryption process. So when you came to decrypt the file, it didn't work. Your data was permanently lost. So for most people, even if they paid $300 to a bunch of criminals, their files were lost. So the only way you could get your files back was to go to your backups, which you hopefully had made and kept up to date, restore your computer, which can be a process that takes hours or days. So we've had a look at the payload. The really interesting bit about WannaCry is how it spread around the internet. And that goes back to a decision made in the early 1990s when some of us were buying our first PCs or offices were getting their first PCs and people wanted to start to join them together. Wiring computers in those days was really hard to get data from your computer to a printer or for two people to share a printer or to share a hard disk. But the demand was there. So Microsoft used some technology originally invented by IBM for the original PC and they glued it together and made a relatively simple way of getting data to pass over a network. And with Microsoft's legendary marketing potential, they gave it the snappy name, the server message block. And everyone calls it SMB. Uh, SMB is still around. It is really useful. It actually does a very good job. However, I'm using that word a lot here. SMB is only designed to be used on local networks, so your office, your home. It isn't designed to be used for technologies such as the internet. You're only meant to use it amongst people you trust, and that's a problem. So if we just take a computer which has been connected to another computer using SMB, if you set it up correctly, no one outside your local area network knows you're using SMB. You can exchange data perfectly safely, and no one can see it. There's a complaint coming already. <laughs> However, that word again, a lot of uh, SMB connect, uh, setups are buggy. People don't follow the instructions properly. They patch software badly. And what happens is one computer on a network will tell the outside world is, hi, I'm part of an SMB network. And there's lots of people out there, good and bad people, who are curious what's going on on the internet. So they are looking for machines connected to networks, and they can see, all of a sudden, this computer saying, hi, I'm part of an SMB network. Now, for a lot of us, we look at that and go, that's interesting. But for a certain number of people, they'll go, ah, I can get into that network using their SMB connection. And some of these people, or software, is malicious. So the malicious software can, cut, can connect to the SMB, net, your local network, through the SMB connection, find the one vulnerable machine, attack that, make it vulnerable, and then it, in turn, can infect every other machine on that network without the person monitoring the network knowing they'd even been compromised. And that's pretty much what WannaCry did. It did it very quickly automatically, without human intervention. And it only needed one machine anywhere on the NHS network, which stretches from the tip of Cornwall to the far north of Scotland, to be vulnerable. There's absolutely no, no evidence anywhere that the NHS was the target for this attack. It just happened to be in the way. It was a very big network, and it just got infected. The thing to remember about SMB, it's in every copy of Microsoft Windows that has been sold since the late 1990s. And there was a bug in Windows. Microsoft didn't realize it. There's about 45, 50 million lines of code in Windows as it comes out of the box. That's before you install anything else. And somewhere in the code that controlled SMB, there was a bug. So every copy of Windows XP had the bug. Every copy of Windows Vista had the bug. Every copy of Windows 7 had the bug. If you add that up, that's 
million copies of Windows with the same bug in SMB. It disappeared when Windows 8 came out, when Microsoft extensively rewrote that part of Windows. Microsoft had no knowledge this bug existed. No one had reported to them. It didn't seem to affect the operation of computers. So, because they didn't know about it, they hadn't written a patch. And we call these a zero day because you have zero protection against this sort of bug. There's no action you can take that will prevent you being affected. 1.5 billion machines, all with the same bug. So this zero day, taking it very simply, did several things. It allows an attacker to access a computer over the SMB network, and then it completely bypasses all the protections built into Microsoft Windows to stop code running. And that means you can write a malicious program that takes control of the computer, does something nasty to the files, such as encrypt them, without the person noticing and without Windows stepping in. And that it works on any machine with that bug. The, but the fix for this was made in 2017, 16 years after Windows XP was first released. Microsoft had only learned about the bug two months previously. So for 14 years, there may well have been people out there who knew about this bug and were actually using it to attack people's computers. And the first one we know about was WannaCry. So when WannaCry gets onto a network, so it's just broken onto the, RNA, onto, a, onto the NHS network, it first goes after machines connected to the same computer network. And what it does, it actually starts scanning the local network, looking for computers that are running Windows and they're also vulnerable. Again, when Jeff, my colleague, and myself tested this, it was scanning computers at a rate of about 10 a second looking for a vulnerable computer. We didn't actually have any connected to it. I should warn that just in case anyone's worried. Once it found a, a, a vulnerable computer, what it would do, it would make a connection to that computer and send a copy of the worm to that new computer. The worm would be installed on that computer. It would start encrypting data. And then it would start looking for other machines on the network that were equally vulnerable. So the worm spreads like wildfire across a local area network. It means that when it starts infecting a network, there isn't time for technical staff to sort of say, OK, can you restart your computer? Can you, you, know, can you, can you just check this? Have you brought your, your antivirus? Because there's someone else on the phone, or their own computers are being infected. And this overwhelming of technical staff was the cause of the problem on the Friday afternoon. And this is how it ripped through the NHS network. Now, the NHS was just one victim of WannaCry. It was also spreading across the world. So, whilst it was also looking for local addresses, WannaCry was actually testing internet addresses. It would choose a random internet address and send a message to that computer saying, are you there? And sometimes, there's nothing there. It didn't get a message back. So, it just, it just creates a new address and then tests the next address. And sometimes, it would try to connect, but that machine had been set up correctly and it couldn't get in. Again, it would say, I can't get in. I'll go try another address. But eventually, by blind luck, and remember, by this point, there are millions and millions of copies of WannaCry running, it would find a computer that was a part of a vulnerable network. It was saying, hi, I'm using SMB. And at that point, it would connect to that remote network and begin the infection of another network. And what you see when WannaCry is running uh, during that outbreak, it doesn't spread gradually across the globe. It appears all over the globe, almost simultaneously. Now, I found a video put together by the software company Malwarebytes and a visualization by the New York Times, and this is six hours on the Friday of attack. And you'll notice it goes global instantly. Almost every urban center is attacked. There are like it will die away and then people will come home from work or people will log on at work in a different time zone and it will suddenly flare up again. And by 7.04, we have a worldwide distribution of WannaCry causing chaos. 
The good news is the attack was stopped very easily. Oops, I've gone, sorry, I'm pressing buttons again, I apologise. Right. <clears throat> what happens when WannaCry attacks a computer? It actually makes a, a request for information to a server with that address. That address, which is unpronounceable, was set up specifically for this attack. And this is a fairly common thing with most malware. A lot of malware is like proper software. It always wants to stay up to date. It's looking for new instructions to protect itself against antivirus companies. It's looking for new orders from its controller. So one week it might be denying you access to your bank. The next week it might be grabbing stuff from your keyboard. Uh, the week after that it might be sending your address book to some criminals in Eastern Europe. And what's unusual, when people started to look inside the code, and this was going on within minutes of the start of the outbreak, is that WannaCry looked for this, strange serve, this strangely named server. And if it couldn't find it, it would, then upgrade, it would then infect any other computer. But the instruction was sort of, if you can find this server, don't do anything. Now, this, what people are now wondering is why this sort of strange instruction was set up. And it's quite possible WannaCry, WannaCry wasn't quite ready for release, and somehow it leaked onto the network. And what they were originally going to write was something like, try and contact this strangely addressed machine. If you can find it, get the latest version of the software, and then attack your local network. And if you can't find it, attack the local network anyway. And this is, seems to be a pattern that the creators of WannaCry were pretty sloppy. They really weren't hardened uh, malware writers. So, again, within hours of this being discovered, a software, prof a software security professional called Marcus Hutchins, who was surfing in Devon on holiday, being the typical hardcore computer security person is never far from his phone, he notices there's a major malware break, uh, outbreak going on. So he stops surfing, goes back to his PC, downloads a copy of WannaCry, which is already circulating amongst the cybersecurity community, and notices this strange instruction that the computer is looking for a non-existent address. So he says, tell you what, I'll spend a few dollars and I'll register this address. I'll set up a computer and let ma let see what happens when WannaCry attacks it. And WannaCry sends out the requests, it makes the connection to the computer, the computer says, hi, I'm here, and WannaCry goes, great, and stops. Any machine that WannaCry was already running on was, as we've learned earlier, officially, totally screwed. But the infection didn't spread any further, and that meant the attack pretty much stopped. Now, later that afternoon, WannaCry's creators released another version of WannaCry with a different address. And another cybersecurity uh, professional noticed the change of address, registered a computer in that name, and the new outbreak stopped. There's a third version of WannaCry that came along about a day later that didn't actually do this request for updates. But by then, people had installed software patches that Microsoft had released, they'd updated their antivirus, and they were generally taking precautions. So by the Monday, WannaCry was pretty much dead. Okay, that's how it spread. What did it do? Well, about six months after the attack, the British government and the National Audit Office released a series of reports into the impact of the NHS of WannaCry. The Friday was bad. Uh, the NHS admits only the most urgent cases were being dealt with people in life and death situations. Even things like heart surgery were being cancelled and rescheduled. Over the weekend, an absolutely heroic effort by NHS staff and their IT staff in particular meant that emergency and primary care was back and fully functional by the Monday morning. However, cleaning up the rest of the NHS network took a whole week. The good news 
no sensitive data was lost during this attack, and there's no evidence that any attempt was made to remove sensitive data from the NHS system. Patient records completely unaffected. They're on a computer, completely different computer system. And the NHS's internal email system also was completely unaffected. So that's the good news. And in total, 1% of the NHS activity was affected. You're thinking, hold on, 1%, 99%, that's nothing until you realize the scale of the nhs at which point you go wow 595 nh uh, gp practices were affected they couldn't get onto nhs systems they weren't able to prescribe medicines they weren't able to look at patient records but it was actually a tiny minority of, of gp practices so your gp more than likely rode this one out pretty well the situation for hospital trusts was much worse. Approximately one-third of all hospital trusts reported significant disruption. Now, that might just mean one computer going down, or it might mean a total lockout. And of those 80 that were affected, 34 reported they were locked out of key systems, in part because their computers were effect infected by WannaCry, in part because they'd resorted to the problem to the solution of literally disconnecting their computer from the network so the infection couldn't spread. But by disconnecting, they couldn't reach remote computers. And of those 34 that were locked out, 27 were of what we call acute trusts, the ones that do the most critical medicine. So the most critical care was badly affected. Break it down into actual human numbers. 19,500 people approximately had an appointment cancelled. That's everything from going into having your dressing changed or blood pressure or blood tests being taken, CAT scanning, through to being prepared for a serious invasive surgery. That appointment was cancelled just so the NHS could concentrate on critical care. The most distressing figure amongst that is 139 of those people had cases dealing with urgent cancer care. These are people who are incredibly vulnerable, going through life-changing situation, and they're suddenly put under additional pressure. So if nothing else, it really makes you realize that malware actually has real human impacts. A total of 1,220 pieces of medical equipment, and that is everything from um, uh, automated blood test uh, analysis through to CAT scans and MRI machines were made unavailable until the PC that was connected to them was replaced or rebuilt. So that had a further knock-on to people who were coming in for, blood, for testing. We don't know how many ambulances were diverted, how many people were unable to go to A&E or were told to go elsewhere for A&E and how many GPs appointments were cancelled. That information was never recorded. It almost certainly runs into further thousands. There's also a financial impact. The NHS estimates it costs £21 million just to fix the most immediate vulnerabilities to get the hospitals and doctor surgeries back on the Monday morning. And that's £21 million that had to come out of existing budgets that were already under, high, under extreme pressure. It took a further £25 million to, to basically perform emergency patching to get the system resistant against future attacks of this kind. And over the next two years, the NHS is going to be spending £150 million on cybersecurity, everything from setting up new reporting processes to training staff to reconfiguring its network so infections can't spread from one side to the other. That's a very quick way of spending £200 million. As I said earlier, NHS wasn't the only target. 150 countries reported significant outbreaks of WannaCry. Marcus's little honeypot which to, of machine, a machine which was being uh, contacted by, by WannaCry reported 400,000 individual computers trying to get hold of it. Almost certainly that number is a gross underestimate. And the total financial cost is estimated to be anything up to $4 billion. And that's everything from lost production to 
uh, the cost of repairing, replacing, reconfiguring computer systems. There, the scale of the attack is quite breathtaking, when you, but then you remember that PCs basically run our world. Um, the NHS wasn't the only healthcare system attacked. Uh, there are reports of Bayer radiology equipment failing in the United States, and that includes um, scanning and radiation dose monitoring equipment for people going radiotherapy. And the uh, Philips and Siemens, who also make medical equipment, reported significant uh, attacks on their computers in the United States. There was a, a hospital in Jakarta was also said it had uh, suffered major problems. Cars. Production lines use lots of PCs, and uh, production lines were actually shut down, which is something car manufacturers never try to do because stopping and starting production lines is incredibly hard. So Honda Japan and Nissan Sunderland shut down entirely. One production line in France was shut down for four days before it could be returned to normal. Uh, less seriously, uh, if you're traveling by Deutsche Bahn in Germany or in Russia, live ticketing information was unavailable, but also so was purchasing tickets. Uh, oil companies, uh, Petrobras is the state-owned oil company in Brazil. It actually took its entire corporate network off the internet until the infection could be brought under control. PetroChina, its petrol stations could not take credit or debit cards because the payment system was knocked out. Power companies uh, in Spain, a company called Iberdrola, uh, they again took their, com their computers off the internet rather than risk infection, whilst the West Bengal Electricity and Company, which supplies 800,000 people in the Kolkata region, it, four offices, uh, mostly dealing with billing, were unable to deal with any customer accounts. Uh, phone companies, there was no outage to phone services, but again, customer-facing services such as dealing with billing, not available right across the world, everywhere from, uh, everywhere from Portugal to Russia. FedEx, um, yep, they had massive problems. They, they reported significant disruption. They haven't gone into it, but pay attention because FedEx does come back later. And finally, a range of government services around the world, uh, from Brazil to Russia and India, where an entire state's police force were unable to access their computer until WannaCry could be removed. One thing people say is, oh, well, it's the N NHS. Oh, it's old, old-fashioned computers that were responsible for um, WannaCry being so serious. And actually, that's not the case. When the analysis is done, 98% of all computers run Windows 7. Windows 7 at the time is a supported op version of Windows. And a patch had been released by Microsoft two months previously. What had happened is the administrators of those computers had not installed the patch. This is important. Again, it comes up later. So we know the impact of WannaCry. Do we know anything about the people who made it? Well, the first place researchers started to look was at this Bitcoin ransom. Where was it going? And uh, a number of Twitter accounts were actually set up showing that Twitter is useful. And they monitored the Bitcoin accounts to see where money was being paid from and where it went. And in total, there are three accounts used with WannaCry that received payments. And they received a total of 340 ransom payments. Remember, we're talking at least 400,000 computers were affected, and they got 340 payments, most of which were not the full ransom, it's worth saying. In total, they earned 50 bitcoins. Now, you've all been following the news, and the value of bitcoin goes up and down like crazy. But at the time of this attack, that is $140,000 Sorry, for a worldwide attack on computers. It's absolutely pitiful. The money stayed there for about two months, and then during July and August, it was gradually removed from these accounts, and that's the point we lose track of it, because rather than paying it directly out into a service that turns it into real money, the Bitcoins went through what we call laundries or tumblers, where Bitcoin transactions are mixed up. And at that point, 
it becomes incredibly hard. And as far as I know, no one has been able to trace the Bitcoins further. So the Bitcoin trail goes dead. However, the payload had some interesting details. And this is something that actually tells you that cybersecurity isn't just computer science. It actually draws on a huge range of disciplines. And, they were, and researchers started to look at the ransom message in WannaCry. And what they found is two of the versions of the ransom message are in Chinese. There's a simplified Chinese and a full version of Chinese written language there. And they both say exactly the same thing. They're grammatically correct. Whoever wrote these ransom messages is fluent in Chinese. And some of the idiom they use is typical of southern China. There's a couple of typos, but again, those are typical mistakes you make when you're typing at speed on a Chinese keyboard. When they looked at the English keyboard, uh, English uh, ransom message, it's pretty good, but there's one howling error, which I hope you've all noticed, that you know, people do not normally say, but you you have not so much time. This person is proficient in English, but is probably not a native speaker. And then, when you look at the remaining ransom messages, of which there's a further 24, they are direct translations of the English language translation, of the English language ransom message. So the people who wrote this were fluent in Chinese, pretty good at English, didn't speak any other languages. As far as we can tell, this is all inferred. And by looking at the programming around the ransom messages, remember this very sloppy, ugly programming we talked about earlier, they left further clues. And it looks very similar to a piece of malware that came around earlier that last year called Contopi, which was another ransomware. Didn't go very far. But there are a lot of instructions borrowed from Contopi, and some of the way the code had been written looks like the code in Contopi. So there's a suggestion the same authors are involved. And these authors go by the name Lazarus Group. It's the name they gave themselves. And Lazarus Group have been around quite a long time. They started uh, and during 2009 when they started attacking the South Korean government. And their first attacks were literally to flood South Korean government servers with so much information they couldn't process legitimate commands. Later on, they started moving to much more sophisticated attacks, including bl uh, blocking access and then also destroying disks. After the South Korean government, they went after Sony Pictures in 2014. <coughs> and here, again, they destroyed computer disks. They leaked personal information of thousands of Sony Pictures employees. And they also leaked... Mum, is that you? They also, leaked the, uh, they also leaked a number of unreleased movies onto the internet. And finally, they leaked um, some very damning conversations held by senior Sony executives amongst, about, about movie stars and their fellow colleagues, which led to several resignations at Sony Pictures. Finally, the one they really became famous for was during 2015 and 16, they went after what's called the Swift Banking Network, which lets move vast amounts of money around the world. And they tried to steal a totally cartoonish $1 billion dollars from the SWIFT banking network through the Central Bank of Bangladesh. And believe it or not, they got away with $101 million. About $20 million of that went through a bank in Singapore and was all brought back. Of the remaining $81 million, only $18 million has been found. So they got away with a lot of money. <clears throat> It's been pretty much certain, made certain that Lazarus is not only based in North Korea, it is an offshoot of the North Korean government, and it is set up not only to harass North Korea's enemies, South Korea, but to raise money. Uh, you're probably all aware that North Korea is very poor, it's isolated by international sanctions, so it has a thriving industry in trying to gain money illegally. Everything from printing counterfeit $100 bills to selling methamphetamines and missiles. So late last year, the British government and the United States both formally blamed North Korea for WannaCry. North Korea has remained entirely silent on this. I'm going to say however again. There's one more thing lurking inside WannaCry that's worth talking about, and that's inside its infection mechanism. 
I've been saying WannaCry is very badly programmed. It's quite amateurish. But deep inside this infection mechanism is a lovely little nugget of code. It's beautifully programmed, it's highly sophisticated, and it goes by the name Eternal Blue. And Eternal Blue is the malicious piece of software that actually gets through the SMB zero day. So we call Eternal Blue an exploit. It turns a bug into a way of attacking a computer. And it's so sophisticated, it bears no resemblance to the surrounding code. And it's the product of a highly organized, very skilled, very well-resourced programming team. And we know who they are. Because Eternal Blue was created by the United States government. More particularly, it was created by the National Security Agency, the NSA. Uh, this is very secretive part of the United States government. For many years, the, word, the letters NSA were told, said to stand for no such agency. Because almost everything about the NSA is classified. It's budget. We have no idea. In 2013, an estimate was released in Congress that it, ha it, was, it was receiving at least $11 billion every year. It has between 30 and 40,000 employees. It is by far the biggest, the best resourced, and probably the most proficient intelligence operation in the world. It's based at Fort Meade, just outside Washington. You can drive past it. It's two really spooky-looking buildings. Inside the NSA, there is a group called Tactical Access Operations, which is basically very, very good hackers. What they do is they write the software that allows the NSA to get into computers of interest belonging to people who are really of interest to the United States government. Tailored Access Operations, sometimes called the Equation Group, They've been linked to previous malware attacks, most famously one called Stuxnet, which was used to attack the Iranian nuclear program during George W. Bush's pre, uh, pre, uh, presidency. However, the Tailored Access Operations Group has a bit of a problem. Since 2015, three members of staff have been arrested for stealing sensitive or top secret data. And this is a very serious crime, as you can imagine. It's almost certain one of these people is the source of Eternal Blue, because what happened is they removed top-secret information from the NSA's very secure systems and took it home onto less secure computers. And it's almost certain that people then targeted them. We now join the best-named of the entire evening, the Shadow Brokers. The Shadow Brokers are a group of people who basically sell secrets. And if you're wondering how the Shadow Brokers sell secrets, what they do, in 20, like in 16th of August uh, 2016, they post a message on the internet like everyone else. They have a blog. They have a Twitter account. And they're literally, I don't try reading it, every single message from the Shadow Brokers is practically unreadable. And what they're literally saying here, we got a whole load of NSA secrets and we want to share it with the rest of the world. Nothing happens between August and January of 2017 when Microsoft, and that is basically warned, it doesn't say by whom at this point, there is a problem in SMB. It took until March for Microsoft to release a patch that was stable, that could work on all versions of Windows. And on 14th of March, Microsoft released the patch for, for uh, the SMB floor. A month later, the Shadow Brokers released Eternal Blue as a package of, uh, amongst many other exploits. And um, again, they posted this on their uh, blog account. The link at the bottom actually takes you to a collection of top secret data from the NSA. There's a password and everything. And within minutes of it being released, security individual, security experts were looking online and saying, yep, this is genuine and it's dangerous. So on the 12th of May, WannaCry is released. There's one bit of the story I should finish with. And this led to a major inter international incident. One of the people 
who have since subsequently been arrested, was being a very naughty boy. More naughty than actually stealing classified information from the United States government. He'd been copying data from the NSA onto removal hard disks. And that, that's bad. He then decided to be really bad and download a pirated copy of Microsoft Office. And he was going to install it. And when he tried to install it, his antivirus software said, this has got malware on it. I'm not going to let you install it. And what he should have done, obviously what he should have done is pay Microsoft for Microsoft Office. What he should have done at this point is not install the software. What he actually did was turn off his antivirus. He installed Microsoft Office. I've waited a bit, switched on his antivirus software. And his antivirus software said, oh, stuff's changed here. I better scan the disk because some of it might be malware. And as he was hunting through all his disks, it stumbled across Eternal Blue. And Eternal Blue's coding looked strangely like malware. Nothing that it ever recognized before. But the software is sufficiently smart to say, this looks like malware. And what almost all antivirus does when it finds malware it doesn't recognize is it sends a copy to its creators for further analysis. And this is where the story gets really bizarre because this gentleman was using software from a very well-regarded, and they are, company called Kaspersky Software. They make a range of security software amongst the best in the world. So Kaspersky received a copy of, the soft, of this malware. You probably need to know a bit about Kaspersky at this point, because Kaspersky is based, as the name suggests, in Moscow. And it was founded by this gentleman, a very highly regarded cybersecurity expert called Eugene Kaspersky, who not only met his wife at a KGB holiday camp, which I, I'm just trying to work out what a KGB holiday camp looks like, <laughs> But he previously worked for the technical facility of the KGB higher school. He says there are no links between Kaspersky and the Russian government. The American government have accused him and Kaspersky of stealing Eternal Blue using the antivirus program. So just before Christmas, you probably saw stories that the American government and later the British government were recommending people in sensitive applications not to use Kaspersky software. And it's for this region, reason that Eternal Blue leaks may have got to the Russian government through a piece of antivirus and a very, very, very naughty person. And I see Helene is now giving me the, um, the time's up thing. So I am going to say this is the end of the story of Eternal Blue. End of the story of WannaCry. But this isn't the end of the story of malware. If you are using computers, and I'm sure everyone here does use computers, the only thing you should do now is to make sure you patch your software often and you do it regularly. Make it part of your life to get your computer online uh, updated as much as you can. Don't wait for updates. Switch on the automatic updates. Everything usually works and you're pretty safe. So please stay safe out there. Thank you, Mike, for an inspiring uh, lecture. Um, have a seat. Um, so uh, now it's time to welcome uh, our panel of experts who will join Mike uh, in the seating area. Um, so first, welcome to uh, Ray Corrigan, um, Nick, Nick Clancy, and Amel uh, Benasser, who will each give a brief introduction to themselves and give their take on the threat um, of cybersecurity through their research in this field. And in Nick's case, on the ground as an information security specialist here at the uh, OU. And we will begin with uh, Ray. Okay, uh, Ray, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, can I say thank you, Mike, for an absolutely excellent talk, an incredibly complex subject, beautifully told. Um, and it's a really difficult thing to, to, to tell these kind of stories because they are so complicated. Okay, um, I want to look at the responsibility for, for WannaCry. And there's a lot of it to go around, okay? So you have the, the creators, obviously, um, <coughs> possibly linked to North Korea, as, as Mike says. You have the shadow brokers who breached the NSA security and dumped all the hacking tools on the internet for anybody to use. 
you have the NHS managers, information systems managers, and uh, poor information security practices. Uh, but I want to suggest that the greatest share of culpability basically lies with those who were supposed to be the grown-ups in the room, the NSA. Okay? They learned about a serious security hold in Microsoft systems years ago. And instead of disclosing it to Microsoft and getting it patched, they decided to exploit it for their own ends, leaving everybody else unsafe. Okay? So they kept it secret. Well, they didn't actually keep it secret because they leaked it to the shadow brokers. <laughs> they left the rest of us exposed and they used it for their own surveillance and intelligence gathering purposes. And in fairness to the NSA, since this has all come out, um, people who specifically used Eternal Blue within the NSA said it was a fantastic intelligence gathering tool. Now, we've got no reason to to uh, doubt that claim. <laughs> However, they used it for more than five years. They knew about it for at least five years and they used it for, for five years, prioritizing their surveillance and intelligent gathering over the wider communication security for everyone. And they didn't know that they'd been compromised for at least three years because the shadow brokers got hold of this stuff in 2013. So part of the argument for saying we keep it secret is, well, nobody else knows about it, except that they did. Russian hackers. Okay? And potentially a lot of other actors that Mike has described as, as part of his talk. Now, the US government has repeatedly given assurances over the course of several um, years that the security agencies do not engage in the hoarding of zero-day exploits. We know from Eternal Blue that's not true. We know from the Edward Snowden documents that's not true. Not only do they hoard them, they're engaged in an open market in buying these things so they can use them for intelligence gathering. Okay? If they're going to be enabled or allowed to continue engaging in those processes, there has to be at the very least a time limit during which they can exploit these holes say six months, for the sake of argument. And if, if it's really critical in the way the NSA guy says it was great gathering, uh, intelligence gathering tool, maybe they could appeal for another six months. But then it has to be disclosed to the vendor and the security hole has to be patched for everybody's security. Okay? I mean, after all, the security agencies have got lots of other strings at their bow. They're not completely reliant on zero-day exploits. I'm just going to round off there because my three minutes are more or less up. Um, the NSA and, and the UK um, equivalent, the uh, GCHQ, have to pay more attention to and privilege wider network communications and critical infrastructure security than um, or they have to pr prioritize it over engaging in surveillance. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ray. Um, we'll now hear uh, from uh, Nick. Um, yeah, Mike, uh, first of all, uh, great lecture, really well put. Um, I think everybody would agree that uh, walking out of uh, uh, the, the theatre here, um, we're all now more well informed of what WannaCry did. Um, certainly from, uh, from my point of view as an information security specialist at the OU, um, the dark world of cybercrime could appear to be mysterious to a few the world of shadow brokers, covert operations. Um, but I'd really like to bring it more into the real world and talk about some security basics. Mike, you mentioned patching. We can't really emphasize enough that manufacturers are issuing fixes um, in the form of patches to vulnerabilities that have been identified with their software and systems. If we don't patch those vulnerabilities when the manufacturers give us those or send us those fixes, then we're exposing our environment to the criminals. The criminals are <coughs> running vulnerability scans on our network constantly. They don't have standards in place that mean they can wait 30 days like we have to or like we do for a patch. 
if they see a vulnerability, they'll try and exploit it immediately. Um, so looking at other, other areas that we can, uh, we can try to use to defend ourselves, awareness and training. So we talk about vulnerabilities, they're not just technical. Uh, vulnerabilities are human as well. In fact, the human factor is probably more vulnerable than the technical factor. So awareness and training of people, giving them more advice. Don't click on the link. Run your antivirus software. Keep your patches up to date on your own personal machine. Ask what you may say as a silly question in a work environment. Protect your family. Make sure you're more cyber aware. Um, hunt out information. Uh, similar to the FutureLearn course that, uh, that Mike and Naranshok put together and, and take it. Um, here in the work environment, um, we like to strengthen our perimeter so the bad guys can't get in. So we invest in, in technology on our perimeter firewalls and endpoint controls in our, on our PCs so that at least we've, we've got some software to defend ourselves against the, uh, the attacks. The other thing that always astonishes me is the amount of access that people are given uh, to, to systems and to files. Um, admin rights when the person doesn't really need those rights to operate uh, their job. So access control, if, an, if the easiest way to hack into a machine is to log onto it. So if you can compromise an account through a weak password or uh, can exploit incorrect access controls, um, then it makes the hacker's job a lot easier. If we haven't controlled access to our critical data and environments, then we're really making life easier for the hacker. The security world, certainly, we can't implement every single control. Or if we, we could, but it costs an awful lot of money. It's just not practical. So we like to assess our security risks and take appropriate uh, remediation actions that are cost effective that don't put us out of business. So centering around the risk management process should be the, the controlling actions that you can take to enhance your defense mechanism. And also, just to finish, I think I may have forgotten, but you really, really should patch. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, now, uh, our final speaker, uh, before opening the floor for questions and comments, uh, is uh, Amel. So, hello everyone, and online as well. So, I'm Amel Benassa, I'm a lecturer at the Open University, and uh, my interest and um, expertise is in software engineering for dynamic systems. And actually, my research is about defining methods and technique to ensure security and interoperability for highly dynamic systems such as the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things uh, integrates technology in our physical environment and actually daily life. So besides your laptop and your phone, you have also your fitness trackers, the smart TV, autonomous vacuum cleaners, and most importantly, the, the people who continually interact with those systems. So what you end up with is a kind of a, what we call a cyber, physical, social systems. And those systems really challenge security in many ways. And um, so what I want, the, there are two points I want to make here. So the first one is, well, I fully agree with you about uh, best practices for security in terms of you know, perimeter security, scoping, and patching. <laughs> And um, they are very efficient to secure uh, kind of IT enterprise systems and also individual devices. But what we need also to consider is the overall systems and the, um, the complex human processes within it and also the heterogeneity of devices, the diversity of needs. So, and because of that, we can't fully control every device there, every, every person there. So one kind of keeping it from being corrupted is often an, not achievable. So more appropriate objective is actually what we call resilience. So making the system able to detect compromise, recover from it, 
and actually continue to operate even if they have been corrupted. So, and the second point is also that this complex system have provide us with opportunities actually for security. So we can harness the capabilities of the, these devices to improve security. So for example, you can use the vacuum cleaner to chase an intruder. You can use your smart TV to, uh, <coughs> to record their movement, to gather forensic information. And also you can use people actually to give you feedback to track uh, suspects. So in other words, is it's the collective about these devices and users that, that creates the problem or the challenge. And it's the collective that can address it. Thank you, Amel. And uh, thank you to, uh, to all of our panelists. I think it really left us with this, this outstanding question of whether it is possible for us to build systems that are completely robust and resilient. Um, so, so what do you think? Um, it's now really time to hear from the room and online um, uh, in terms of practicality. So please uh, introduce uh, who you are and where you're from. And please keep it short so uh, that we can answer as many questions as possible in the, the time that's uh, allowed. So opening the floor for questions. Is there a question there? Thank you. Hi, my name is Thane Turn. I'm also from the computing department. My question is about the economics of the ransomware uh, to Mike. So do you think the ransomware maker wanna cry? Do you think they made money or they lost money? Because they probably will have invested some money in developing their software as well. So I want you to comment a little bit on the economic side of ransomware. Thank you. Um, uh, this doesn't seem to be a very successful one, uh, ransomware attack. There have been several in the past that have raised millions of dollars. And last year, ransomware was definitely flavor of malware that really was spreading very quickly. It's died out in the last few months. This does not appear to have been a particularly successful one. It's clear they lashed the code together. They didn't have a very great deal of experience in this area. So I think they were probably incredibly disappointed by the fact that so few people paid the ransom and the fact that it was able to kill the attack quite so quickly. Um, there have been ransomware since that looks like ransomware. There was one during the summer last year that was incredibly no notorious. Um, it started in Ukraine, and it was called NotPetya. And it looked like ransomware, and it, when it infected your computer, you got the red screen. It told you, pay $300 of, uh, in Bitcoin. And what it actually had done is trashed your disk. Uh, so ransomware is moving on from actually being getting money to a way of locking up computers and destroying data. And the NotPetya attack, um, I think that went on to affect 64 different countries. And it affected big business in a major way. Um, for instance, household names like Merck, the, um, the pharmaceutical company, and Molymersk, the enormous container company, both report around $300 million in losses. Uh, but in that case, it's quite clear the malware was designed to be destructive, hiding behind ransomware. In the last few months, what's actually happened is they've now moved on to what's called cryptoware, which is a piece of malware that gets onto your hard disk and starts mining cryptocurrencies using your computer's processing power and sending them the rewards. Uh, I haven't seen many um, ransomware attacks in the last few months, though there was one circulating quite recently, again using Eternal Blue. Do the other panelists want to add something to that, or shall I move to the next uh, question? Um, there was a question back there. Hello, yes. I'm, my name is Stan Relahan. I'm visiting from Sydney, Australia, where I'm a recruiter for the cybersecurity and defence sector. And you were talking earlier about the NSA, and I guess if it hadn't been for their development of that most sophisticated tool that was in the core of this, this would never have happened. They're a pretty sneaky bunch. <laughs> I guess <laughs> it's been, I, I guess they're paid to be, but yes, one of the things that I believe that they've also been responsible for is the development of the anonymous onion router, Tor browser. Tor, yeah. Could you comment on that perhaps? 
Okay. Uh, yeah, Tor, if those people don't know about it, is an alternative, an alternative way of browsing the internet, but not the World Wide Web. And what it does is it hides you and the data you're sending and all the other users behind multiple layers of very strong encryption. And it was actually created by the American Intelligence Service so they could communicate amongst spies. Uh, that no way, even if they're in a very hostile country where all internet connections are monitored, there was no way for the intelligence, for enemy agent, agents to get into the network. But what they realized was if the only people using Tor were spies, you could find all the spies by seeing who was using Tor. So they later released it to everyone. And you can go download Tor right now. Um, it's synonymous with what we call the dark net, which everyone thinks of as drugs and um, crime and prostitution and everything like that. Uh, it is actually a genuinely useful tool. And it's actually left the American government in a bit of a cleft stick that um, I think it's now funded by the Naval Office in um, the American Department of Defense. And, and also, at the same time, the FBI is saying we need to be able to crack into Tor, and the NSA is trying to break into its own creation. And they very famously, when Edward Snowden released his file, file of information, he released a PowerPoint uh, presentation, and there's um, a, um, one slide, which is basically huge, bold text, Tor stinks. <laughs> And the best intelligence services in the world say they cannot break into Tor. And the Russians, I think, have now put up a million dollar reward for anyone who can reliably break into Tor. So they've created this monster, and now they kind of want it back. Um, I think it's brilliant. It is. I mean, I, I would add one, one uh, warning to that. I mean, don't necessarily believe that Tor is completely secure. No. Um, because when the intelligence agency declares something publicly, it doesn't necessarily mean it to be true. That's, that's true. And there have been, there have been a number of published attacks on the Tor Indeed. network. Because it's relatively small, if you can monitor enough of the Tor network, you can kind of work out where some Tor users are. That's right. So are the NSA actually to blame for the problems that we have? I would say that... Um, <laughs> I kind of want to walk out tonight. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's not just the NSA. Um, uh, the Aussies in uh, cahoots with the NSA in New Zealand and, and um, the UK and Canada uh, have what's called the Five Eyes Arrangement. I don't know if people are aware of this, but um, I'll, I'll take a short detour for me. During the war, um, Alan Turing went to America to um, share some intelligence. Um, being Turing, he wasn't particularly well organised. Um, wound up in Ellis Island for three weeks because he showed up without a passport. He then spent three months trying to battle the intelligence bureaucracy in the States to get access to the information that he went there to get in the first place. At the end of the war, the, uh, even the thickest of bureaucrats decided that it probably hadn't been a good idea to tie Alan Turing up with red tape for, for three months at the height of the war. So they decided that we would um, get together with a specific agreement between five English-speaking countries, New Zealand, Australia, England, or, or Britain, um, Canada and the US. And this Five Eyes Agreement uh, is an agreement between the, uh, the five countries to share intelligence between these five agencies. Um, and generally, it works um, quite, quite smoothly and openly. They also declared, as part of this agreement, that they would not spy on each other, which they instantly reneged on. <laughs> um, but getting back to your question, are, are the NSA culpable? Um, yes and no. Um, I think the practices of the NSA and DCHQ are questionable. I think their addiction to mass surveillance has been damaging to everybody. Um, and I think uh, the classic example in the case of the WannaCry is that they sat on this security hole for such a long time that it had been uh, exploited by m many nefarious actors over the course of that time. Um, so there has to be better checks and balances in place to, to control the operations right across the board. Blaine. Hi, Blaine Price. I'm a professor in the computing department. Uh, a question for the whole panel. Mike, you alluded to uh, some of the other disciplines that go into um, attacking or, or, or uh, helping with cybersecurity beyond the technical ones like cryptography. Could you and the panel just talk about some of the other disciplines that, that help for uh, cybersecurity? Try start. Let's walk this. Let's work this way. Um, the one I would start is um, there's a huge. 
we concentrate on malware tonight. It's a tiny part of, of computer security. The, um, as Nick said earlier, the human factors are really important and how people behave. And it's everything from when, if you're working in a, a building, someone tailgating you through a door, or sticking your, pass, uh, your, um, your, sticky, your password on a sticky note and putting it by the computer, or e making easily guessed passwords, so your last password ended door one, so you move door two. So there's an awful lot of psychology, there's an awful lot of studies of human behavior that go into not only defending against attacks, but a lot of attackers will spend very long periods of time analyzing companies and individuals. So some of those messages that you get in your mailbox saying, um, you've been offered a new job somewhere, will you fill in this online CV and do things like that. You've been targeted, not necessarily because you have access to information the attackers are interested in, but you work for an organization that handles that data, or you know someone on Facebook who does that. So. I, th I think the, psycho the psychology and the human factors are a key, but, uh, and they're not really appreciated because they're not really quite, uh, they don't make such good movies, possibly. <laughs> uh, it's always good to see someone typing in on a computer and lights flashing and power stations blowing up and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, the long surveillance of someone's behavior on Facebook, which goes on regularly, uh, it doesn't get nearly as much attention. Agreed. You guys want to go? I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> cool. So, um, so certainly, you know, if we look at the way people, um, so if we look at the way people um, protect their own data, so you'll often see uh, friends, colleagues with pop-ups in Facebook, uh, sending them a, or asking them to, to wish them happy birthday. So they've uh, immediately given a, a piece of highly confidential information to, to most of the world. Certainly most of the security professionals put false dates of birth in uh, social media so that we, we don't get caught out. Um, but it's surprising how little attention most people pay to their own personal information. So if you then take that to a motive for a hacker, hackers are looking at some way in um, so that they can fulfill their objective, their motive. Their motive may be harassment, it may be for, for financial gain. It may be part of an organised uh, crime syndicate. But they're looking for weaknesses. And unfortunately, most of us um, enable them to exploit those weaknesses through our everyday use of, of technology, social media. So again, it goes back to awareness and education. So, so yeah, so I think one of the one of the reasons that makes cybersecurity very difficult is actually its multidisciplinarity. So you need a lot of areas actually to, 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 to work there. So there's the psychology, the sociology, and there's also kind of to understanding what leads people to, 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 to kind of write malware or to, to, to try to exploit the thing. So there is also the economical aspect. There is the legal aspect, is how we deter people from doing that. There's other, other things, so for example, the ethics. So why, uh, for example, software engineer will release malware, how they can patch and how, so how, how the, you know, the surfer can help. So it's, there's also a whole area about kind of responsible software engineering and ethics that is also involved. So one of the reasons cybersecurity is very difficult is because it's not only a computing, uh, computing problem, it relates to economy, to legal aspects, to ethics, to, to psychology, to a lot of things. And people need to cooperate actually to understand this very, very different aspects and come up with solution that encompasses all these aspects. Yeah. Uh, Adrian Wales, IT department. I've got a smartphone that's now no longer maintained by the manufacturer. I can chuck that away, 200 quid. I've just bought a smart car, uh, a car with an internet connection. When do I just throw that one away? <laughs> do I, w w I can't patch it. No. When Skoda stop providing the patches, what, what should I do? So unfortunately, Adrian, it's, uh, your car's just driven itself away. <laughs> 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 you put it on eBay. 
Um, great question. I think um, when we, uh, we touched on the Internet of Things, um, certainly technology seems to be ever connected to everything. Um, having a smartphone, it's a commoditized device. Um, certainly uh, the manufacturers are trying to sell us new devices, slowing old devices down in the hope that we'll throw those old ones away. Apple certainly do a great job in um, making sure that their phones are end of life because as soon as you drop one, it is end of life. Um, I'm not sure whether it was, that was a, a design feature um, to make them obsolete, but certainly with the cars, um, um, my thinking is that we're going to have to, when you go for a service in your car, your services may be more, more frequent because you may have to drive in there and have a patch to your car in the same way that we patch the software systems that, that we, we use today. Um, but it is an interesting worry. The Internet of Things brings a whole new magnitude of problems to security uh, because the vast majority of things that people now want to connect to the Internet are made by people uh, working to low margins, DVDs, um, uh, players, whatever. They're not interested in security. They want to sell you gadgets, okay? And way to sell you gadgets is say you can connect it to the internet. <coughs> Who cares if it's not secure? And actually, a set of webcams and DVD players were um, hacked. Um, was it a year before last, yeah. Mike? Yeah, uh, in yeah. a bot, Mirai. Uh, the Mirai um, malware was just used to, to basically take down large chunks of internet infrastructure. Off the back, Netflix. including Netflix, which is crisis. Uh, <laughs> off the back of a whole bunch of, of items which were never, never designed to be secure, uh, and there has to be a lot more regulation. I mean, software is made on the basis that you release it fast and you release it often. That's how you make money. Okay, there is no regulatory control over it. Not like health and safety in cars or airplanes or any of the other stuff that we have. And until you bring that kind of of legal regulatory re regime and economic pressures to bear in the software industry, you're not going to get the same level of safety. You're not going to get the same level of security. And certainly when you start uh, connecting dolls and, and uh, bits of, of vacuum cleaners and, and everything else, um, all hell is going to break, break loose, basically. Um, sorry, just, no, sorry. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Go first. So just kind of to go into a more positive uh, <laughs> vibe. So there is that. So it's still at the research, and we recognise that there are kind of vulnerabilities that are created because of this openness. The only so that the idea we it's still at the research level, but we want to actually use because this car is made to communicate with other other cars, other things. So. What we are looking at is how to use other cars, the infrastructure that needs to communicate with it, to control it in a better way. Because from the start, so you built onto the interaction as an opportunity to, to improve the functioning rather than only a problem. We're looking at how you actually improve the, the resilience of the car by controlling it, by <coughs> building on their capabilities and using the capabilities of the devices that already interact with it. So for the car, I don't have a ready idea, but that's, that's, that's the thing, is how to use the devices that you, your car, your things already interact with to protect it, actually. So if it's going into, a, say, on an edge, how you use a car to stop it or to, yeah. That's the idea. <laughs> I just got one final thing to Adrian. Uh -huh. You've got a phone that is no longer receiving updates and you're still using it. Um, I'm a Yorkshireman. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, no, uh, basically, it's, it's, uh, this is something I particularly think the Android market is incredibly guilty of, of releasing devices at very high cost and then 18 months later saying, we're not supporting it anymore, buy the new phone. Um, if you are not receiving updates, you are not protected against new attacks. Uh, Google are taking steps basically to take control of the Android market in a much more strengthened way and keep lifelong support. And unfortunately, it really pains me to say this, Apple have actually done a much better job here that even quite antique iPhones here, yeah, we're now talking about things nearly five years old, uh, are still receiving regular software updates and are generally more secure. And the reason we kind of know 
iOS is more secure is because there are companies out there that buy zero days quite openly in the market. And I was actually doing some research for this talk, and I thought, okay, I really have to hunt around and find them. Type in, you know, market for zero days. First result on Google is a company called Zerodium, um, based in the States. It was founded last year. And it's, it acquires zero days exploits and news of hacks and sells them on to governments and corporate customers. And it actually has a price list on its website. It's the most eye-opening. Uh, Zerodium.com, I think it is. Um, There's loads of them. There's loads of them. But Zerodium is just funny. Because I mean, yeah, if you want to get prolonged access to an iPhone, <laughs> And um, without using the passcode, Zerodium will, will buy a zero day from you for one and a half million dollars. So if you know how to get into an iPhone, you can make an awful lot of money. Uh, the Android exploits are much cheaper because there's more of them around. So um, I'm not, I, don't, I don't have any shares in Apple, um, but they do actually do a security quite well. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one thing where, so because the, the, with the Internet of Things, so even with the new generation of software and everything, it's just kind of, it requires new methods. So not necessarily the, the, the old traditional update, etc. So even, even the software we, we write now is trying to be adaptive, trying to be, you know, more easier to change. So you have, I'm not going to go there, but to all the machine learning stuff. So it's to build software that is adaptive. And also the security part needs to be adaptive. So in terms of you don't want to have the same probably old methods on IT and enterprise and try to apply them. Maybe the idea is to diverge from that and having either security mechanisms that adapts or software of, for the car that adapt so as it ages or as it's 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 able to just adapt itself and change itself rather than waiting for an update from somewhere else building software for car that is able to change rather than waiting from from the change from somewhere else <laughs> so that's <laughs> time for one final question i'm afraid uh, the lady over there uh, had her hand up first yeah Hi, I'm, I'm Sarah, and I used to be an OU student, but it was natural sciences, um, and I'm a digital marketer. Um, so two things. One, I have a car that I've only had it a year, and I've had three software updates already. It's driving me insane. Um, this, is, this kind of links into the whole Kaspersky thing. Um, given what's just been going on with this Russian spy poisoning bit, um, this has completely exploded. Now, I've been... My father used to be a diplomat, um, so I'm naturally suspicious of anything. And it seems to me that potentially what's going on with this whole Russians poisoning thing is nothing really to do with the poisoning, and potentially it's more to do with Eternal Blue and Russia's access to um, like trying to get into our computer systems and, and hack various governments, especially given what's been going on in the States with the whole interfering with the election and stuff, do you think that that's... I know it's not necessarily your area of expertise, but do you uh, think... I, I've got no evidence there's any link between the Eternal Blue thing and, and what's going on in relation to the recent uh, spy allegations against Russia. Um, what you can say is that, that there is direct evidence that the um, Russian-funded hackers were directly involved in interfering with the US um, election, Trump-Clinton election. Um, we know that because um, as they were doing it, as they were hacking the democratic servers, um, Dutch intelligence agencies had hacked into the building in St. Petersburg where these people were doing the hacking, and they were actually watching them on webcams <laughs> uh, and had shared this intelligence with the, the US intelligence community. So the US intelligence community were aware prior to the election that the Russians had been engaged in hacking the democratic servers. Um, and then the question becomes, at which point do you start disclosing publicly that kind of thing is going on? Um, uh, the, the, um, the whole aspect of, of the 
the recent um, deployment of nerve agent on the states uh, on the streets of the UK is, is a whole different story. And, and I mean, that's been, uh, it's not the first one, is it? We had the guy yeah. on the bridge with the umbrella, and then yeah. we had Litvinenko a little yeah. while ago. <coughs> Just sort of the, the reaction to this round of poisoning seems to have been a lot more extreme than, than we've had with other rounds, so I just wondered if it was sort of tied well, in with the cyber security is a different ball stuff. game to, to the kind of things that have been going on previously. I think it's fair to say the Russians have absolutely left the West <laughs> standing in their ability to deploy new technologies such as um, fake news, um, the poisoning of online discussion rather than perhaps uh, people in, in streets, and also their use of cyber weapons. Um, the UK, um, I think Five Eyes have basically blamed Russia for the NotPetya attack, which crippled Ukraine last year. And there's at least one group in um, Russia, which is called Sandworm, um, and they were have been fingered as the, the group that actually created this. And they have close associations, shall we say, with Russian military intelligence. Um, there are a large number of hacking groups in, in Russia. The Russian gov government uh, um, denies absolutely they are government funded and there is no definitive link. Going through cyber forensics, you can never actually find someone in the Kremlin typing in malware. Um, however, there are a large number of groups uh, with, whose aims align with those of Russian diplomacy. So the attacks on Ukraine, Ukraine hasn't been attacked once in the last two year, three years, sorry, it has been attacked three times and two of those attacks were on its power grid. To, and the, the, the type of attack they use is not a group of teenagers uh, on energy drinks and pizzas in a bedroom, it is something that requires months if not years of planning to get into and cripple these systems. And what's very worrying is the same malware has recently been spotted circulating on the American power grid. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, Mike, for that. And uh, I think uh, we, we come to a sort of natural conclusion here. And I'd really like to th thank uh, Mike and also the, the panelists again for uh, an excellent uh, evening. Um, so th there are opportunities here at the uh, Open University to study curriculum uh, related uh, to Mike's topic, uh, and some of the relevant courses are listed uh, on the slides and displaying now. I hope it's somebody. Somebody's still there. Yeah. Uh, uh, blue on black. Um, yeah, and um, I should also mention. So um, this is this is one of the topics that the OU um, engages with. Um, there's also uh, an upcoming inaugural. Um, titled uh, He Denies the Very Existence of a Woman uh, Mathematician by June Barrow-Green, Professor of History of Mathematics, and that's on uh, Tuesday the 22nd of May, and the details of this uh, event are on the Open University uh, Research uh, website. Um, so thank you again everyone here uh, for, uh, for joining us, um, and for everyone who's here in the, in, actually in the barrel, um, uh, please do come and join us uh, downstairs. There's uh, refreshments, and I think there's also an opportunity uh, to continue the discussion with the panelists. I'm sure they will be happy to do that. So thank you again for, uh, for joining us.